Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Flagler Museum and to the 29th Annual Whitehall Lecture Series. This is the fifth and final lecture in this season's lecture series. The theme this season was Crimes of the Century. And um, I want to take just a minute to make sure we take care of a couple of housekeeping things. By the way, my name is John Blades. I'm the director of the Flagler Museum. Please take a minute to make sure to make sure your cell phone is off. Please don't assume that it is. And if you happen to make it past the staff with one of those audio tour ones, would you hold that up so the staff can collect those? Those have internal alarms that are sometimes set off by the uh, AV equipment in this room, and um, that can be rather surprising and disturbing. Um, these lectures are webcast live, and we have a number of people have joined us up and down the eastern seaboard for the lecture, so we welcome not only you who are present here in the grand ballroom of Whitehall, but those who have joined us via the internet. If you happen to be out of town and can't make one of these lectures, you can join this lecture from anywhere in the world via the internet and hear the lecture, the same audio that those of you are hearing now, and see the same pictures that the audience here in the grand ballroom can see. Uh, and then later on, we edit these lectures and preserve them as videos. Uh, so that they can be enjoyed on something called the Gilded Age History Channel, something the museum created where you can go to see more than 100 videos about this amazing time period in American history. I want to thank our sponsors who helped make this possible, the Max and Victoria Dreyfus Foundation and the Palm Beach Post, and I want to thank the museum staff who worked very hard to make this lecture series and many other programs here at the museum possible each year. In fact, you've got a season program guide at each year's seats that outlines the variety of programs offered here at the museum throughout the year. I hope if you're not already, you'll consider joining the museum as a member, but joining the museum in many of its programs throughout the season. There's always something going on here at the museum. Now, today's lecture uh, will be given by Paula Urabiro. Um, it's called American Eve. The It Girl and the Crime of the Century. It involves one of the most famous architects in America, the son of a Pittsburgh coal and railroad baron, and an incredibly famous model and actress. All the elements of a great crime, don't you think? Just doesn't get much better than this. Of course, we're talking about architect Stanford White, Harry Thaw, and Evelyn Nesbitt, the It Girl. Um, Paula is a professor of English at Hofstra University. She's an expert, of course, on Evelyn Nesbitt, having literally written the book. And this time period, she's very interested in the Gilded Age. She's widely published, has appeared on A&E's biography, PBS's History Detectives, The American Experience, and she's been a consultant for the History Channel. But most importantly, I think, her grandfather and father spent their careers working for Standard Oil. So she's one of us, right? Great. So, if you're ready, Paula, please join me in welcoming Paula, your bureau to the Flagler Museum's Whitehall Lecture Series. Thank you very much, John. I also wanted to mention just briefly, John did say I'm an English professor at Hofstra University. I'm also, I teach film studies, and for the last six years I was a vice dean. The reason I mention that is because a couple of years ago a student came in looking for the dean of vice, so I figured he read my book. <laughs> Um, let me say that, first of all, this is a magnificent place, and of course, that's one of the perks of talking about the Gilded Age, although I did give a talk at the Tenement Museum as well in New York City, so. Um, but I'd like to begin right at the beginning uh, and show you the cover of my book because I feel this, I'm very lucky to have an extremely attractive subject matter. I figured if nothing else people would be interested in the book for the pictures and I made sure there were a lot of pictures in the book. Um, but that is Evelyn and uh, I begin my talk by quoting Oscar Wilde, another great figure of the Gilded Age who said that America went from barbarism to decadence without any civilization in between. <laughs> I don't know if I agree with Wilde but certainly there's enough decadence and even a little barbarism in this story to keep anybody interested. Uh, when, and this is another um, picture of Evelyn uh, at 15. So. When I began this 
research, it actually started out, I was doing a course, designing a course for a literature course called Daughters of Decadence. It was going to be about the women writers and the depiction of women in literature at the turn of the century. And I kept coming across images of Evelyn Nesbitt, and I said, I know, I know Evelyn Nesbitt. But what I knew of her was what I had read in E.L. Doctorow's Ragtime. Uh, I had seen the 1955 film version, The Girl in the Red Velvet Swing with Joan Collins. And so what I knew was, the more I researched it, the more I realized it was much more about mythology than reality. And this picture, for me, captures that, because if you look at the top pictures of Charles Dana Gibson drawing, and with the idealized versions of the three people who are the central characters in this drama. And I say drama very deliberately because, of course, it all comes to uh, an, a head in a theater, in the Madison Square Garden Rooftop Theater in 1906, in June 25th, 1906. But what we have here are the three central players in this drama. And <laughs> the man on the left, who is routinely considered a genius, that would be Stanford White, the man on the right, who uh, generously, some people have said he's not quite an imbecile, which I think may be a little overstating things, but that's Harry K. Thaw. And of course, in the middle is the girl, literally with a face to die for, Evelyn Nesbitt. Now, I say that there was a mythology, uh, and in the course of doing my research, it took me 10 years to write the book, I discovered that uh, over a hundred years, a lot of myth mythologizing takes place. And I wanted to get to what the reality was, what was the historical reality, what was the, the context for things. And the reality was that Manhattan at the turn of the century, and this is, these are two pictures. One is at the top of Fifth Avenue and the upper reaches of Fifth Avenue, and the bottom picture is Madison Square Park. And the reality was that the city was undergoing sort of an overwhelming transformation at the time. And the person who was, the person who really was uh, quite literally the, the figure who was at the center of it all was Stanford White, the architect Stanford White. White, of course, was this club man extraordinaire. He was a visionary. He was a, had 60 projects going on at any one time as an architect, but he was also a designer. He was a, he was a connoisseur. He was this larger-than-life character who was at home anywhere and was everywhere. And this picture kind of shows that. If you look on the upper left-hand side, the picture on the left, you always can tell White. He's got the biggest mustache, right? He's the man in the mustache, the big mustache at the James Hayes and Hyde Ball in 1905, which he designed. He was known for transforming restaurants like Sherry's or the Waldorf into copies of Versailles, bringing in 50,000 white roses to decorate and things like that. On the right, he's at a Vanderbilt costume party where he designed the costumes and set the theme for the night. On the left, lower left, he's at a dinner for a playwright. So, the top sort of is literally the upper society, and he was also at home, though, in the lower echelons, the lower regions of the society, not the least of which on the right is the artist colony, the artist community, the bohemian types, and there he is at, on the very right-hand corner, you can see him at an impromptu modeling session that was taking place in Augusta St. Gaudens studio, and we'll hear about him in a minute. So White was this sort of, of uh, Evelyn describes him as a force of nature, like an earthquake. And it seemed like everybody liked him except for one person. And that person <laughs> is Harry K. Thaw. Now, Harry is the poster boy for Mama's Boy. He was the heir to a $40 million fortune. As John mentioned, the family had made its money after the war, both in Coke and Railroad. <clears throat> and Harry was known for his antics. The, the, the Mad Harry was his nickname, and he used to do the, the lighting his cigarettes with $100 bills, and he wrote, tried to ride a horse into the Union Club. And of course, this is the man who wondered why he was being, not being allowed to join these clubs. Well, he blamed Stanford White for that. He said that Stanford White, in his mind, Stanford White was the reason why Harry was not allowed into any of these clubs. And he had made that decision before Evelyn ever came on the scene. I mention that because one of the myths is that there was somehow this 
triangle, there's a love triangle that happened and it, there's definitely a triangle, but it's not a love triangle as much as it is a, a, a triangle about obsession, I think. So before Evelyn ever came into the picture, Harry Thaw was obsessed with Stanford White. Thaw had said that he would never set foot in any building that was designed by Stanford White, which really was going to curtail him a great deal in New York City. And of course, White's crowning achievement, or one of them, certainly, was the Madison Square Garden entertainment complex that he built across from that little park where we saw the picture before. It was a block long. It had a tower that he modeled after the Giralda Tower in Sevilla in Spain. And at the top of the tower was a statue. Now, we'll see that in a minute. The man on the right upper right is white again. And on the bottom is Augustus St. Gaudens, who was one of White's good friends. And his friends joked when he did the garden, when he designed it, they said it was the biggest pedestal he had ever designed from one of St. Gordon's sculptures. Now the sculpture in question is this, the Diana. And you've probably, if you haven't heard about the Diana before, maybe you've seen it if you've been to the Philadelphia Museum of, of Fine Art, or if you've been to the American Wing of the Metropolitan Museum, there's a version of it there. The Diana statue uh, went up on top of Madison Square Garden and immediately caused a scandal and a sensation. Uh, the story goes that prior to this, Madison Square Park was this wonderful little serene place where nannies would push the children through in the, in the carriages. And as soon as this went up, they had to run through the park because you might catch a glimpse of this naked woman who was, let's face it, she was eight stories high. I don't think anybody was going to actually be able to see her although they said that young men with field classes, you were bumping into people all the time. <laughs> Keeping in mind that this is the age when a glimpse of stocking was something shocking. Now, the Diana, Diana is this, <laughs> she is the goddess of chastity, wink, wink, uh, and which I think was qu quite the joke between White and St. Gaudens. White was uh, fairly known for having relationships with younger chorus girls in the tower, in various places around the city, one which he called his snuggeries. Supposedly, this is where the term love nest comes from, that White was up in the tower, and, and the phrase, come up and see my etchings. That's attributed to Stanford White. Now, if you notice here, that what's interesting about this is there's, it, it seems like there's two versions of the Diana. What happened was the Diana went up and White immediately incurred the wrath of none other than Anthony Comstock. Comstock was, a civil, he had been in the Civil War, he was now the moral police for Manhattan, and he had created the society with the suppression of vice. And the cartoon over there shows you that if he had his way, he would cover up all the statues, anything that showed any nakedness, including the Diana. And his efforts at, uh, cleaning up Manhattan morally were being funded secretly by none other than Harry K. Thaw. <coughs> I want to go back for a minute because what White did, oops, sorry. What White did was he, to, to, to get Comstock up his back, he said, okay, we'll put some clothing on her. Well, in the middle of you can see, it hardly covers anything. They created this little drapery, St. Gardens created this drapery, which literally blew off with the first big wind that came. He said, well, we tried, you know, we can, what can we do? Uh, but I also want to point out that White then was so angry at, B, at the censorship and at the, what he considered the prudery of Comstock that he told his workmen to install those arc lights underneath so that not only would you see Diana in the daytime, but you would see her brilliantly lit up at night. In fact, you could see her, they said you could see her all the way to Philadelphia. So uh, in any case, eventually he agreed to take the arc lights down, but Diana stayed in all her glory as a weather vane pivoting on the little ball at the top of Madison Square Garden. So there's Comstock again, and there's Harry Thaw who's always sort of lurking in the background. He's sort of, the way I depict him in the book is he's sort of the white doppelganger. Uh, he's sort of like this gothic figure who's lurking in the shadows, sort of waiting for his moment. And this is the world now that Florence Nesbitt finds herself coming to. She comes to Manhattan 
in 1900. And her name was not Evelyn, it was Florence. Her mother was Evelyn, but she was Florence. And she came to New York, the newspapers immediately picked up on the story because she, she was such a, an overnight success as an artist model that they said she came with nothing but her looks. You know, she had the face, the face was worth a fortune. But in reality, she came from an impoverished family. Her father had died a few years earlier unexpectedly. The mother, they were thrust into poverty. It was sort of like something right out of Dickens. And, but as you can see, Evelyn was such an incredible natural beauty that immediately the technology of the time, the, the, the ability to capture her and photographs made her one of the darlings. Uh, and then ultimately, I, I hate the term supermodel because it sounds too modern, but she was the model that everybody wanted, all the artists wanted. Um, and the picture on the left is interesting for another reason, because that was the image, the picture that uh, Ellen Montgomery, who wrote Anne of Green Gables, <coughs> saw, and that picture was the inspiration for her to create the character of Anne of Green Gables, which, if you know anything, it's this wonderful, innocent children's <laughs> book, and so it's interesting that Evelyn was the inspiration for that. Nonetheless, here we have Evelyn in two other modeling poses, and of course, the thing about Evelyn was she could be whatever, she was whatever anybody wanted her to be. On the left, she's the modern Helen. On the right, she's posing for the famous New York painter Carol Beckwith, and the, the name of that painting is Girlhood. So, she also became an advertiser's dream. And a lot of what we, you don't even necessarily know if you're looking at images from the Gilded Age, if you're looking at products from that period, she was the model for those products, including the famous Whitman sampler. She also became a cover girl. Now again, the timing was perfect for Evelyn to come along. Well, Florence, I shouldn't call her Evelyn yet, she's still Florence, because she was on the covers of all of the new women's magazines that were becoming popular at the time, including Vanity Fair, Cosmopolitan, uh, Harper's Bazaar, the Women's Home Companion, and she was on other magazines as well. But here we see different versions of Evelyn, and I think the amazing thing about her, of course, is that she looks so different in every picture. And I think that's one of the reasons why artists loved her, because she did look so different. So, Evelyn decides at the age of 16 that she wants to go into the theater. And not just anything, but she wants to go into the most popular show that was on Broadway at the time, which was Floridora. Now, this is one of the myths as well, because the Floridora Sextet was the famous group that you see in the background there. And the big show-stopping number was, Tell Me Pretty Maiden, Are There Any More at Home Like You? Well, Evelyn was not one of the Floridora girls in the sextet. She was actually just in the chorus. But she was so stunning that she stood out. And who other than Stanford White went to see the show 40 times, eventually getting one of the chorus girls to bring Evelyn to an apartment that he had on West 24th Street to come for lunch. So Evelyn uh, goes this one afternoon to this apartment building, which is you see on the left there um, on West 24th Street. It was right over the FAO Schwartz toy store. And there's something really disturbing about the fact that this, the toy store was in the bottom floor of this building that was one of White's snuggeries. One, Evelyn went there that afternoon. White introduced her to the Red Velvet Swing. What it was, was there was a room, a big, a large room on one of the upper floors with a swing that was actually bolted to the ceiling. And he had a paper Japanese parasol that was t up on the ceiling and told her to try to kick her foot through the parasol and to pierce it. And if there are any Freudians in the audience, you can think about that. <laughs> but basically, it all, but it all seemed very innocent to Evelyn, at least at that point in time. So here we have another picture of Evelyn. So she continues to model, and she's modeling in the daytime, and she's performing uh, as an actress at night. Now her mother, who's there on the right, I, I like to give myself sort of little visual cues, and I always felt that her mother, when I started the book, I had great sympathy for Mrs. Nesbitt, the idea that this woman's husband died. She was completely unprepared 
to be a widow and to try to make a living in the, at the period when she had two young children because Evelyn actually had a younger brother who was constantly being farmed off to family members and friends. But I felt bad for her until I realized that, uh, and this is a story that is, I said, is about obsession and I think it's also about sort of kind of monstrous behavior. And I use that term very specifically because uh, both Evelyn's mother and Harry Thaw's mother, who I'll talk about in a minute, um, to me ended up being sort of monstrous versions of a mother. Evelyn's mother was allowing her daughter to model in the daytime, even though she claimed that her daughter never modeled in the altogether. When I look at those pictures, I think, that's pretty close to the altogether if it's not quite. And then let her go on stage at night and, and didn't go to the shows. She expected that Evelyn would come home. And Stanny, uh, so Evelyn, by the way, Florence changed her name to Evelyn when she became an actress. Uh, which is interesting. Again, the Freudians can think about how she usurped her mother's identity, but she becomes Evelyn, and Stanny says, oh, don't worry, I'll, I'll, he acted very paternally, taking care of her. He bought her, among other things, this little Red Riding Hood cloak, and the chapter in my book, I call him the Big Bad Wolf, and he buys her this cloak, and I think that picture really, for me, captures the, the incredible dichotomy between this man who is at that point 49, 50 years old, and Evelyn is 16, right? So he insinuates himself into the family's life. One day he says to Evelyn's mother, you know, it's never a good thing to leave your family for too long. You should go back and visit them, and I'll take care of Evelyn. And so he took her that day in the morning to his offices of McKim, Mead and White, and I think it was McKim when he said, by the way, this little girl's mother has left me in charge of her. And he said, oh my God. <laughs> so the day after Evelyn's mother left, from everything I can tell from my research, Sandy said, we're going to have a fun day of modeling. And he had her trying on, it was sort of a marathon session of trying on different outfits that he bought her, including he told her this kimono that he had brought for her specifically from Japan. It cost $2,000. Now, I, I sh there was a lot of pictures. I picked this one for two reasons. One, because it's one of the most famous images of her. And it's the one that causes people to have, to be confused. The title on the, this was a postcard, by the way, that you could buy for a penny at the time. And it was called Little Butterfly. And I've actually had people say to me, oh, well, she was an opera star. She was in Madame Butterfly. I said, no, 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 she was not an opera star by any stretch of the imagination. I've heard her sing and it, she was not an opera star. Um, but the, this picture is sort of iconic and it really captures what happened. The sort of innocent girl, she's on the bearskin rug. Uh, White had the photographer taking these pictures. Supposedly this was the last one that he took. And then he told her the next day, why don't you come uh, tomorrow, I'm gonna have a party. So Evelyn shows up the next day to his apartment and sees that there's nobody there. And White says, oh, isn't it terrible? Nobody else has come. Well, we'll have a party ourselves. And Evelyn's thinking, OK. And so he said, let me show you this room. So he takes her up the stairs to another room that she hadn't seen that had mirrors on the floor and mirrors on the ceiling and a mirrored bed. And uh, of course, I don't want to give you too many of the details because you want to read about it in the book. But basically, what he said to her was, or what Evelyn says in the way I describe it in the book is that she went into that room of virgin, but she did not come out one. So from that day on, Evelyn at 16 becomes Stanford White's mistress. Now, again, I think that this is one of the, for me, the fascinating thing about this whole story is that it's not just a question of, it wasn't just a scandal, it wasn't just eventually a crime, but these were all people who were larger than life in, in very specific ways. White was sort of the embodiment of the energy and the drive and the metamorphosis of New York, and also the dark side of what was happening in New York at the time. Evelyn now becomes literally the icon for her age. White said to her, listen, I don't, you don't need to pose for all those old, st old stiffs. He said, I'm gonna introduce you to some real artists. So one of them was Charles Dana Gibson, and of course this is the famous image of Evelyn as the eternal question. And you can see her in the middle there, and it was a very popular image. It was reproduced over and over again. 
uh, on magazines and on pinbacks and fans and sheet music and things like that. And uh, so Evelyn continues her modeling career now. Her mother has turned a blind eye. Whether her mother knows or doesn't know or doesn't care about it, White is taking care of her family. He moves them into an apartment. He's giving her mother some money to live on. He's paying for her brother to go to school. And supporting Evelyn's career, all of this is being done, by the way, under the guise of her being his protege and him being some sort of paternal benefactor. Well, he also takes her to the famous photographer Gertrude Casebeer. And this is the other sort of iconic image of the Gilded Age, for me anyway. I think it certainly captures everything about the period um, and I remember, I have to say, the first time I saw this picture, I didn't know it was Evelyn Nesbitt. It was on a poster at the uh, Museum of Modern Art. They were doing an exhibit of uh, phot photography. And I bought the poster, and I only found out years later that it was Evelyn Nesbitt. The title was Miss N. Now, what I want to point out about this, and this is why I think it is so sort of iconic and such an, uh, the embodiment of the period. You know, in the Gilded Age, I'm sure you know that um, young girls wore their hair down. Once you became an adult, a woman, you wore your hair up. And of course, we see that Evelyn has it both ways here. She's got it down and she's got it up. We see that she's dressed in some sort of vaguely mythological or ancient or old-fashioned costuming. But at the same time, her gaze is very direct, it's very seductive, it's very forward, it's very much the new woman. And that's why I say that this picture really captures the dichotomy of the period, you know, the image of the Gilded Age that had on the one level the beauty and underneath either the possibility of something forbidden, something that was darker. Um, but Casebeer knew what she was doing when she did this photograph in any case. Um, it's hard to believe, but even in spite of Evelyn, Evelyn's charm, Stanny had a roving eye. So Evelyn has turned 17, she's all of 17. And she's disappointed that Stanny's paying too much attention to other girls. He buys them flowers. He has them. Uh, he sends them to the doctor if they need medical attention. In fact, one of the things that Stanny did with Evelyn the first day after meeting her that day at the red velvet swing, he sent her to his dentist because she had the tiniest little chip in her tooth, and he wanted to have her tooth fixed so that she would be perfect. Um, but he's doing this now with other girls, and Evelyn is just, she wants to, what do you do if you're 17? You try to make your boyfriend, if you perceive of him as your boyfriend, jealous. So she, one night at a party in the tower in Madison Square, meets none other than Jack Barrymore. I say Jack because he wasn't John Barrymore yet at the time. Ethel and Lionel Barrymore, of course, were already well known as actors, but Jack Barrymore was not. He was actually a cartoonist for a newspaper. He had not, uh, he had not jumped in feet first yet into the family tradition of acting. And he was immediately smitten with Evelyn. Now here she is at that time, at the time. She was now in another show called The Wild Rose, which was supposedly named after her. According to the story, he sees her at White's party. He writes, he asks her for her phone number and writes it on the cuff of his shirt. And they begin what amounts to about a month long frolic, is the term that Evelyn used, hoping that Stanny would become jealous. Stanny was very happy. Stanny wanted, was, I think he, he said, I made a mistake with this girl because Evelyn was not a dumb girl. And she, was, she had a sort of insatiable curiosity, intellectual curiosity, and also, I think she, he, other girls had used Stanny, but I think Evelyn, whether it was because she lost her father early, but she really fell in love with White. So he was just as happy to get her sort of off his hands with Barrymore. And fortunately for Evelyn, something terrible happened. Now, according to all the research I did, Evelyn had never, and, and with everything that's gone on, Stanny always made sure that he brought her home at night whether it was 4 o'clock in the morning or 2 o'clock in the morning. She had never stayed out all night, but she did one night with Jack Barrymore. And the story they told was that they had had too much red wine. They were down in Greenwich Village, and they fell asleep. Uh, he fell asleep on his father's cloak from the Count of Monte Cristo. And when they went to Evelyn's apartment in the morning, they opened the door, and there's Evelyn's mother, who's furious, and Stanford White. And 
Evelyn's mother is saying, can you believe this? Oh my God, what are you, what? And she's, Evelyn is crying. And the way I describe it in the, in my book, it's like something out of Chekhov, I imagine. So a decision is made, keeping in mind that Evelyn is still only 17, a fate worse than death, she's going to be sent to New Jersey. <laughs> She's sent to New Jersey to an all-girls school, Mrs. DeMille's school, which was owned by Cecil B. DeMille's mother. So Evelyn is devastated. She's got to leave this, the gay white way. She's going to leave modeling. She's going to leave acting. And she's going to go to school. In the meantime, she had been getting lots of fan mail from secret admirers and not-so-secret admirers. And men were writing sheet music for her. And one of the very persistent male uh, correspondents was somebody named Mr. Monroe, who kept sending her flowers. He sent a piano to her apartment. He sent uh, silk stockings. And Evelyn kept turning all this stuff away. The story goes, and I've got it pretty much uh, verified by her family, is that she, one day she got a dozen roses, and there was a $50 bill wrapped around them from Mr. Monroe. And Evelyn said, send the flowers back, but her mother kept the money. She agrees to meet this Mr. Monroe as, well, something to do before she goes off to the wilds of New Jersey. So she's at Rector's restaurant, and there's a picture of Rector's there. You can see one of those beautiful Gilded Age restaurants, right? She's sitting in Rector's, and in comes this man who literally gets down on his knees and starts kissing the hem of her dress. And he says, do you know you're the prettiest girl in New York? And Evelyn is sort of horrified, actually. She's not, she doesn't like this at all. And then the man stands up and he says, I am not Mr. Monroe. I am Harry Kathoff of Pittsburgh. And I laugh because Evelyn, in her own letters and memoirs, said, I don't know what he expected me to do, faint, you know. Uh, so she said, oh, indeed, OK. And she thought he was kind of creepy. And that's it. She goes off to the old girl's school. But now Harry knows who she is, and she knows who Harry is. And then something happens, and this is one of the issues that is, uh, people have debated with me about. But Evelyn went off to the all-girls school. She had an attack of appendicitis. And her mother tried to contact White, who could not be uh, reached. He was out of, out of the country or out of town on business. So her mother contacted Harry Thaw. Harry Thaw swooped in, brought the best doctor. They performed the appendectomy at the all-girls school in the classroom. And Evelyn Harry says, I'll, help, I'll pay for you and your mother to come to Europe and have a recuperative trip. Well, I'm shortening things significantly here, but what happens is I, the, I call it the worst mistake of her life, the biggest mistake of her life. It's one of several, but this probably is the worst, because when she goes to Paris, she's in an adjoining suite with Harry, and her mother is there as a chaperone, but one night, Harry gets her alone, and he says, tell me, tell me about Stanford White. And Evelyn, who hadn't said anything for two years to anybody, not her mother, made the biggest mistake of her life and told Harry what White did to her. And that was all he needed, because that's what he had been looking for all along, proof. Harry, because Harry had a, I say he has a smorgasbord of mental problems, he was crying, he was slobbering, he was sobbing. And uh, there's a whole series of events that take place where he shows his dark side to Evelyn. But nonetheless, as I say, I'm, I'm cutting some of the stuff out. I mean, you have to. You, it is fun to read it in the book. But uh, Harry pursues Evelyn. And here we see the deliriously happy couple. <laughs> Now, again, Harry pursued Evelyn for two years. The, one of the things that people like to say to me is, oh, she was this little gold digger. And I said, well, if that was the case, there was plenty of millionaires prior to Harry Thaw that she would have married. Some, uh, the joke was, you know, oh, I got a, I got a diamond uh, necklace from, a, from an old lobster at Rector's, you know. And, well, I, got a, I married the lobster. That used to be the joke. But Evelyn actually held out until the ripe old age of 19 when she sort of said, I think, in the way I interpret it, it's the second biggest mistake of her life, which was to say, you know, here's, she grew up in the shadow of the Thaw Mansion. I mean, the Thaws lived in this mansion in Pittsburgh. Evelyn had been impoverished. It's sort of like, a, you know, the equivalent of living in Hyamsport and in the shadow of the Kennedy compound, and now one of the Kennedys is asking you to marry him. So Evelyn marries Harry Thaw, and 
<laughs> what I find very interesting is after 10 years of research and even subsequent to that, I continue to look for images. This is sort of an early version of Photoshop. They actually are no pictures of them together. This is a picture that was sort of put together <laughs> for publicity purposes uh, of Mr. and Mrs. Thorne. This is another postcard that you could, could buy at the time. So Evelyn goes to the mansion, to live in the mansion in Pittsburgh. One of the caveats is that she absolutely has to not only, she, she's long given up modeling and also the theater, but she can't even mention it because Mother Thaw, who is this sort of monstrous figure, who is literally suffocating, uh, suffocating mother, and she was constantly getting Harry out of prop, out of trouble from his whole life. She thought she was going to get another coronet. Instead, she got a chorus girl, and she was mortified. But anything, if Harry wanted this girl, okay, Harry could have this girl. What happens is they were trying to portray Evelyn as the mistress of the mansion, and there she is in the ermine cape, and they're taking these more dignified pictures of her. And much to Mrs. Mother Thaw's horror, that Christmas, <laughs> a calendar came out with Evelyn's modeling picture on it, and she was horrified. She tried to buy the calendars back, but she couldn't. Um, and then Harry, who had been on his good behavior for, I guess it literally was sort of a honeymoon period, decided he, he couldn't give up this obsession with White, even though he had proof now of what White's debauchery. And he started to think about all the other girls that White was still possibly defiling. And so he tells Evelyn, we're going to go on a second honeymoon, we're going to go to Europe, and we're going to have a brief stay in New York. So on June 25th in 1906, Evelyn and Harry, are, he tells her that morning we're going to go to a show. And she said, oh, where? And he said, Madison Square Garden. And she said, oh, <laughs> because, I mean, he knew the stories that she had, he had forced her to tell him over and over again. She knew that he didn't want to be anywhere that was associated with white. Uh, nonetheless, and it was extremely hot, they go to the theater and Harry is wearing this long overcoat and because he was so eccentric, everybody sort of accepted it. They were with two other people who were friends of Harry's, two men. They went to see the show on the rooftop theater under the shadow of the Diana who is up, up above them, you know, pivoting on her perch. And this is, a, this is what the theater looked like. It was an open air theater on the rooftop modeled after the European style. And the show was apparently terrible. It was opening night. Evelyn was a nervous wreck because she was afraid there would be some confrontation. She always thought that Harry, though, was a coward, but she didn't want any kind of a scene. And she was grateful when they got there that White was not there. It was opening night. It was, he always went to opening nights. And this was his theater. But nonetheless, he wasn't there. However, there was one person there. And the man on the left, lower left-hand corner, his name was James Clinch Smith. And he was Stanford White's brother-in-law. And I mentioned him, this is one of those things that you learn when you're doing research. It's sort of an interesting little side note. But that night, of course, White is going to be killed. And his brother-in-law didn't recognize him when he passed the body because his face had been so disfigured by the powder burns. And Clinch, himself, Clinch Smith himself would die on the Titanic six years later. So what happens, of course, is that much to Evelyn's dismay. There's probably 10 minutes left to the show, and they hear a commotion, and he, in walks Stanford White. Goes towards his table. He's by himself. He sits at the table. Evelyn says, I think we should go. <laughs> and Harry uh, agrees, and the two friends get up, and they all walk towards the elevator, and Evelyn turns around, and Harry is gone. And of course, we all know the story. Harry walks up to White and shoots him point blank three times, twice in the head, he hits him in the shoulder, and White falls down dead. And, you know, the pandemonium uh, that happened, I, it's very funny when you do enough research, there were like 28 New York newspapers at the time, and, uh, and I also read 6,000 pages of the trial transcript, and what was interesting to me, there were two things that were very interesting. One was the fact that all the eyewitnesses who were there, I mean, he shot him in front of 900 people, the people that were the closest said Harry held up his gun and he said, I did it because he ruined my wife. But one of the people who was closest said, no, he said he did it because he ruined my life. And that's a very different thing uh, to me. And of course, um, if Harry is going to claim that he did this 
to def in defending his wife's honor. It's about four years too late. <laughs> so nonetheless, the other thing that was interesting, of course, was the media circus began immediately. There was, Harry was taken across the Bridge of Sighs into the tombs. The newspapers started asking the question whether the thought was justified because, of course, White can't defend himself. He's dead, and all these stories are now coming out about him and about the the demi monde in the world, the lower, the darker side of Manhattan, and picture taking sessions and red velvet swings and all this kind of stuff. And when they asked one of the Tenderloin cab drivers if he was surprised, he said he wasn't surprised that White was shot. He was just surprised that it was a husband because he always thought it would be a father. So Harry goes to prison. Now Harry was delusional enough that he thought, he actually thought he was gonna get away with this murder, that he was going to be hailed as the conquering hero, the knight in shining armor. And one of the first things he did was to have, have his picture taken in, in, in the tombs prison with his valet and his butler bringing him his clothes and having food brought in from Delmonico's. He had the doctor convince them that he needed a bottle of champagne a day. And his lawyer said, Harry, what are you doing? You, we, we try to get sympathy for you, and this is not going to garner sympathy with the average citizen. Nonetheless, the Thaw's plan, and actually the defense was sort of a genius strategy. They said to Evelyn, you have to go on the stand and tell what White did to you, because that is the only thing that's going to save Harry from the electric chair. And Evelyn says, but I don't want to. And they said, listen. You have to do it, there's no other choice. Listen, we'll take care of you financially, and of course Evelyn at this point is facing, uh, what, is her, what are her choices? William Travers Jerome, who was the sort of pit bull, they called him the courtroom tiger. He was a first cousin of Jenny Jerome, who was, of course, Winston Churchill, re related to Winston Churchill. But William Travers Jerome tried to get Evelyn on the stand, tried to break her, and much to everyone's amazement, of course, Evelyn, they dressed her like a little, like a schoolgirl, and she is only 21 at this point, but she got on the stand and told about the red velvet swing. I mean, this was unheard of, you know. Uh, I mentioned to John today that the Teddy Roosevelt was trying to suppress the, they were printing the testimony in the newspapers, and they said it was, it was destroying the morality of the country and this kind of thing. The amazing thing is, so Evelyn gets on the stand, she talks about what White did to her, you know, he broke her heart, and then uh, this, that, and the other thing, and they keep playing on the Diana image in the newspapers with White. Harry, on, for his part, doesn't even understand what's going on. His, his lawyers say, we, should, we really should go with the insanity defense, because that's kind of the only way you're going to get off. And Mother Thaw says, absolutely not. We do not have insanity in our family. You know, and uh, to quote Brendan Gill, the family was nutty as fruitcakes, at least as far as uh, Harry and Harry's mother. There was a brother who was incarcerated in any case. Um, they tried to go with, uh, I love this phrase, dementia Americana. The unwritten law was in a brainstorm that Harry was possessed with dementia Americana, which meant that he was going to defend his wife's honor. Well, it's hard to believe, but, uh, and the Thaw's, Mother Thaw poured m millions of dollars into Harry's defense paying alienists a thousand dollars a day, a, a whole horde of alienists to talk about a temporary brainstorm. It ends in a hung jury, which is sort of amazing. In the meantime, the Thaws put on, <laughs> they have a movie made called The Unwritten Law, which ends with Harry being freed and angels are seen singing in the background. Uh, but the reality was that Harry was, there was a second trial, and Harry was acquitted by reason of insanity and sent to an asylum upstate. Now Harry was more, Harry couldn't believe it. He, he, I'm not insane. He's yelling, I'm not insane, while he's cutting out paper dolls at the defense table, you know. Um, and Harry goes off to the asylum upstate. Evelyn finds that Mother Thaw now is in charge of the money, and she has no intention of giving her anything. You know, it ended badly, and if it wasn't for you, my son wouldn't even be in this place. So Harry spends the next five years trying to <laughs> prove that he's sane. One of the things he does is begin divorce proceedings against Evelyn. Uh, the story goes that someone, the milkman, left the door open and he escaped to Canada and uh, was brought back. And finally, Harry is um, 
found to be sane and he's, he's released. Now, uh, this is an interesting little collage here. I, I find it interesting, if you notice, that this is Harry, that's Harry before he's actually released from the asylum. Clearly he was not cooped up. He was there in Atlantic City. He's supposed to be in the asylum of state, but he was in Atlantic City, and I noticed that these guys are kind of propping him up, right? But he does eventually get out, and then within a matter of years, he's found whipping a young boy in a hotel room uh, and sent back to an asylum for another eight years. I forgot to mention that when Harry was uh, Mr. Monroe, one of the things he used to do was to entice, put an ad out and have young girls come. This is where the barbarism comes in. I put it out of my head. Harry used to advertise for young girls who want to be actresses to come to the, get training, and he would beat them with dog whips, and he would scald them with uh, boiling water. Anyway, Harry is found sane. Uh, again, after eight years, and as you can all see, he died in Florida. Harry died. The, one of my favorite stories, and it may be apocryphal, but it's still a great story. Harry came down to Florida in the 20s when there was a huge boom in putting up uh, hotels, some of which were not as attractive as others. Uh, and according to the story, Harry looked at one just horrendous hotel and he said, I think I shot the wrong architect. <laughs> so over the years, what has happened? Well, Stanford White, of course, his reputation suffered greatly, his personal reputation, and even his reputation as an architect fell out of favor, um, and uh, it's taken a while for him to be rightfully uh, looked at again as, as a genius, as the, the genius that he was as an architect. The picture that you see next to him there is a, an archer figure. And I kind of see that as a metaphor for White. He came through his, you know, damaged, but he has survived now after 100 years. What's interesting about that Archer figure is that it was discovered a few years ago in um, what is now the French Embassy, but it was it was the f a house that White had designed for the for the Whitneys on Fifth Avenue. And when it was when it became the French Embassy, someone at a party said, "That's a Michelangelo sculpture." And, Turns out that it is, or at least they're, they've been verifying it. And um, it was one of the things White had in a storehouse that he decided he wanted to put there because it looked nice. Uh, so on the left, you saw there's the building. And on the right is the building today. Actually, it's a parking lot. <laughs> I show this picture because uh, the Red Velvet Swing Room, there was a fire, and then in 2007, the whole building collapsed. And that was the day that I handed in the manuscript for my book. So I was worried that that was some kind of cosmic sign. But uh, in any case, Evelyn, of course, went on to try to eke out a living. She went into vaudeville. She um, did have a son who she always claimed was Harry Thaw's son. And people may have questions about that. But basically, she claimed that uh, her son, Russell, was the product of a conjugal visit to the insane asylum. And it's certainly, it's, a, it's the $64,000 question. But uh, I've, I've gone both ways with it because I've seen pictures and they look so much alike. It's frightening at the same time. Uh, there's also evidence I've discovered since the book that indicates that his father might not have been Harry Thaw. Nonetheless, um, Russell Thaw, uh, which is also her grandson's name, and he's a, I have to just say he's a tremendous person who helped me a great deal with my research. In any case, Evelyn continued to sort of try to make a living. And just like she was the reflection of the period that she came to New York in 1900, it's almost as if her life reflects every decade. There's another, she's sort of like the phoenix. So that um, she wrote her own book called Prodigal Days in the 30s. Then we have The Girl in the Red Velvet Swing in the 50s. And then, of course, the El Doctor's Ragtime, where she's a fictional character. And then they did the musical, the movie Ragtime, then they did the musical, the Broadway musical. So basically, this is, uh, we're down to the last two pictures. This is, again, Evelyn as the model, first coming to New York at the age of 15. And the question is, is it innocence or is it experience? You know, which face is it? And I will leave you with this, and then I will take questions uh, and that is, what do you think of Mrs. Thaw? <laughs>
So if anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to. Any questions back there? Watch it all the way back. Oh, the age difference between Thaw and White. Well, Harry was 36 and White was 50 at the time. So Harry was almost twice Evelyn's age when he met her, and White was almost three times her age. Yes. We have a question online. Yes. How much money did Evelyn make as a model, and did her mother keep any of it? <laughs> how much money did Evelyn make as a model, and how much did her mother keep of it? Her mother kept it all. Evelyn never saw any of the money that she made, either from modeling or acting. That's one of the things. She never, she actually, uh, when I talked to her grandson, Russell, I said, you know, how was your grandmother with money? Like, because he knew her as his grandmother. And he said she was a free spirit. If she had money, she gave it away. It never meant anything to her because really she never had any to begin with. And she made, I think at the height of her modeling career, she was making $25 a week, which, you know, her mother, she never saw any of the money because she was a minor. It's sort of, you know, her mother is the stage mother who took care of the finances, never had a job herself for the entire time, and really abandoned Evelyn. I forgot to mention that once the, the scandal happened and the murder, her mother had already remarried, went off to the suburbs of Pittsburgh, and when someone came to her door, one of the newspaper reporters, to ask her about Stanford White, she says, I never met him, I don't know. So. Question over here. <laughs> well, we've had that conversation, actually. There's uh, at least, uh, I don't know if it's the original. The original Diana was, the, the, the Madison Square Garden came down in 1925. The statue was packed up, put in a crate, sent off to a uh, Brooklyn, some uh, warehouse in Brooklyn, and John and I were talking about this afternoon. There's a version of it which is uh, at the top of the stairs at the Philadelphia Museum of Art, and there's a small, an even smaller version that's in the gar in the sculpture garden of the Me um, Metropolitan Museum. We tend to, we seem to think that the one that's in Philadelphia is not the original because the original was 18 was was very big. It was the reason why they couldn't put it on the tower. They tried and it was too big, so they had to take that down and then put the smaller version up. So in answer to your question, that's a question that still needs to be answered as far as where the original Diana is. Yes? What happened to Evelyn Nesbitt? Where did she end up? Evelyn Nesbitt ended up um, as a grandmother, as a, as a mother with her son and then a grandmother. She lived with her family in California. And she opened a ceramic studio in the 50s. She became the consultant for the girl in the red velvet swing, and she was very upset that Joan Collins played it because she said her boobs were too big. Um, and then she died in 1967 at the age of 82. Yeah, okay. Yes? What, what, to what extent did her emotional immaturity and her cognitive, at, at the age of 15, 16, play a part in this? I think it's certainly, I mean, I think, I, I like to think that I was, for example, a, a, a smart 15-year-old, 16-year-old, and I did some dumb things. <laughs> so I think at 15 and 16, and of course, if you put it in the context of 100 years ago with such limited choices and having no moral guidance, I mean, her mother was not offering her any kind of guidance. Everyone she ever put her faith into betrayed her, her mother, her father, Harry, these people that she sort of invested emotionally in. And I don't know that, I think certainly her immaturity, I think that the, the one thing that I find really sort of symptomatic of that was trying to, thinking she could make Stanford White jealous by going out with John Barrymore at 17, because that's what a 17-year-old would do when White had no intention of leaving his wife. And so I think it certainly played a part, you know, the, the, the psychology of, of, of a girl at the turn of the century who was thrust into these kinds of situations. I mean, she was certainly a very intelligent girl and had a lot of intellectual curiosity, but that doesn't mean emotionally she was any more mature than the other, any other 15-year-old. We have another question online. Yes. Uh, there was a nude image of Evelyn, and the listener is wondering what was it about and when was it done? There was a nude Im image of Evelyn. Are you aware of one? Uh, I'm not aware of one. Um, 
maybe if they were looking at the slide, it, she was partly nude. Oh, well, those are pictures, of all of the, most of the best photographs of Evelyn were the ones either done by Otto Sereny, which are in the Smithsonian, or Rudolf Eichmeier, Jr. He did one of the little butterfly, and a lot of those other images were Eichmeier's, so. Um, and he had, there's a museum of his in Westchester, but also his images are in the Smithsonian and the Library of Congress. So that's where you can find those images. And in my book. <laughs> there are 50 pictures in the book. I, by the way, I just have to say this. Um, when I, I had originally wanted the, the title to be Murder in the Garden because I figured it was Eve and you had the creator. And my, the editors at the time said, no, yeah, we have to tell people what this is about. So they were the ones who wanted the it girl term. And I said, well, I don't want people to think I don't know my history because Clara Bow was the it girl in the 1920s. But I agreed to let them use the term and said, well, she was the it girl before people knew what it was. So, Any more questions? You have another one online, right? Mm -hmm. Go ahead. After Stanford White's death, did any parents or other girls he had deflowered come forward? After Stanford's wife, after Stanford White's death, did any other girls come forward? No, and I they didn't. And I think one of the most interesting things about that, and I think, you know, it's a it's a it's a very slippery slope to try to decide whether White was, uh, you know, had pedophilic tendencies or was, you know, uh, just an uh, an amoral character. But the fact is. Up until Evelyn, it seemed like whatever girls he had been involved with, he took care of them, he gave them money, and uh, after his death, no, no one came forward, which is, again, he had never been blackmailed before then, and even Evelyn didn't, you know, she even says in her memoirs that, um, well, she says plain girls are happiest, and she also said that uh, Stanford White didn't do, it was my own, uh, my own painful way to experience, but no, no, no other girls ever came forward. So, although Harry said there were 348, I don't know where he got that number wow. from. Yes. What's your next book? My next book is Lizzie Borden, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, people say I have mother issues. I don't know <laughs> father issues, but uh, Lizzie Borden is my next book. Another question? There's one way in the back. Oh. Yeah, well, it's funny. Um, in the course of doing the research for my book, I discovered a short clip, a film clip, which you can see it's on YouTube. It's Evelyn in the 1930s singing in a nightclub in Panama. Um, it's the only recording I've been able to find of her. Her family doesn't have anything uh, that's close to even when she was younger, but it's her singing. And if you go on YouTube, if you put in Evelyn Nesbitt, it'll it will come up, but she's singing, I'm no man's woman now. It's, <laughs> One more question online. Yes. How many buildings did White design or erect in New York? <laughs> well, I, I don't know that I've ever counted. I think you'd have to go online because White designed so many buildings. And even after his death, when he died, he had something like 60 projects going. So, for example, Penn Station was one of the buildings he had a, had a hand in designing, which was finished after his death. and. So there was, uh, I don't know that anyone's ever counted the number of, you, you, you know, if you want to count the Washington Square Arch is a monument, is it a building, and Tiffany's, and you know, all those places. So I don't have an exact number. Thank you very much. I appreciate you coming. Thank you.